Hi, I'm Charlotte, and I was the student artist in residency at Recology for October 2019 to January 2020. I love my experience at Recology. I learned so much, and I was able to make do with very little, including what I found in the pile and a few extra supplies. While I was there, I made cyanotypes from images I found in books and catalogs. I'm a big believer in sourcing images and reusing materials, and today I'm going to show you how to make a cyanotype print using a found image and an object. First, let's talk about what a cyanotype is. A cyanotype is a photographic printing process that involves combining two chemicals, paracomonium citrate and potassium ferrocyanide. These chemicals are then coated onto paper and left to dry. Next, when they're exposed to UV light, a chemical reaction occurs that creates a distinct Prussian blue color. Cyanotypes were invented in 1842 by the astronomer Sir John Herschel, who was looking for a way to copy his notes. Later on, they were used to copy architectural plans known as blueprints. In 1843, the botanist Anna Atkins became the first person to use cyanotypes for photographic purposes, which was used to create a book of impressions of British algae in 1843. Now that you know a little about the history of cyanotypes, let's get started. The supplies I used for this project include paper. I've had the best results with Archie's Platine paper. You can buy this pre-cut or in 22 by 30 inch sheets. You can also use printmaking paper, watercolor paper, or any other kind of absorbent heavyweight paper. A ruler for cutting down your paper. Chemicals. I use photographer's formulary liquid cyanotype kit. A container. Foam brushes. A light safe bag or box to keep your paper safe after it's coated. Source materials. This is the image or object you will make your print from. Transparency paper. If you decide to make an image from a digital negative. An easel or any other piece of glass will work. Trays. These are optional and you can make do with things around your house. Hydrogen peroxide, string and clips for hanging up your prints to dry. I bought all my supplies from freestylephoto.biz and Blix, but definitely try to shop small, shop local, and use second hand when you can. If you choose to cut down your own paper, you're going to start by measuring and marking the back side of the paper. You will know which side is the front and which side is the back based on the embossing in the lower right hand corner. If you can read the text, you are looking at the front of the paper. And if the text is backwards, you are looking at the back of the paper. This is important to know because we are going to be coating the front of the paper with our chemicals. Once your marks are made, lay your ruler flat across the paper and start tearing from the top right corner downwards. It doesn't have to be perfect and you can always trim up the edges after your print is done. Finally, it is a good idea to initial or mark each sheet so you will be able to tell which side is which when it comes time to coat. When you're ready to coat, you're going to start by mixing equal parts solution A and solution B. It is important to note that I'm coating at night with only dim lights on. As long as there is no UV light, your chemicals should be safe. Make sure you have something to protect your working surface. I'm using a clear plastic table protector, but in a pinch you can use cardboard. After your chemicals are mixed, you're going to take your foam brush and dip it into the liquid. We want it saturated, but not dripping. You can squeeze off the excess liquid using the walls of your container. 
Start by coating the center of your paper and brush outwards to the edges. Try to make strokes in all directions to get an even coat. Off camera, I'm placing my coated sheets onto a piece of cardboard to dry. Wipe off your surface in between sheets to ensure you're not getting any chemicals on the back of the piece of paper. Continue on like this until you're done coating all your sheets. Once your paper is dry, you're going to want to put it in your light safe bag or your light safe box. This is going to protect it from UV light until you're ready to make your exposure. The images that we're going to be using for our digital negatives actually came from these old life magazines that I got from the Berkeley Swap Meet. These are years 1958 to 1966. I chose to cut out some old cigarette ads um, and this one actually is a jewelry ad but when I cut it out I kind of like the image on the back better. So I'm going to be using these ones for my negatives. The next thing I'm going to do is scan it into the computer. If you don't want to cut up your old magazines you can always make a copy first and then cut from there. Once you've scanned your image, you're going to open it up in your photo editing software. This doesn't necessarily have to be Photoshop. Any photo editing software will work. These transformations are going to be super simple. First, we're going to rotate this. And here is where you'd make any adjustments to the exposure, brightness, contrast, anything to make the image look exactly the way you want it. With this one, I'm just gonna leave it the way it is. The next adjustment is black and white. I kinda like the way it looks with a yellow filter. After that, you're gonna invert it. And finally, you're going to flip this so that it's a mirror image of itself. Next, I'm just going to straighten it out a tiny bit. And that's pretty much it. With the other image, what I did was I started with a Google search image of the constellation Scorpio. Then I added my scan. I cropped her out. And then I did the same series of adjustments that I did with the other image. Next, I created a new canvas and I put both of the images on there. This is eight and a half by 11 and I'm gonna print this out. This is gonna print out on your transparency and that's basically it. The transparency paper that I use to print the digital negative is called Pictorico. This comes in 8.5 by 11 sheets that can be used in any inkjet printer. These two images printed on one sheet that I cut in half. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to take your cyanotype paper and you're going to put your negative face down. One way to tell if it's face down, emulsion to emulsion, is if you wet your finger and the emulsion side of the negative is actually sticky. So that's why we flipped the image in Photoshop because it's gonna go face to face. Of course, you're gonna wanna do this in a dark room. I'm just doing it out here in the light so that I can show you how it's done. I use an easel, which is a piece of glass in a frame, but you can just use any piece of glass. You just need your paper, your negative, and the piece of glass. With your negative and coated paper sandwiched between glass, it's time to expose your image. 
All you need is UV light, either from the sun or artificial bulbs. I'm making my print indoors with the windows open and the light hitting the paper directly. Under normal conditions, or when using artificial lights, some good exposure times to start with are around 10 to 15 minutes. The shortest time I've exposed a print has been for about 5 minutes outside in direct sun, and the longest I've exposed an image was for about an hour indoors when it was overcast and raining outside. In this video, I'm exposing my print for about 20 minutes. After your print has exposed, you can put it back in your light safe bag or box until you're ready to develop. You can also make an image from an object, in this case, flowers. By placing an object onto light sensitive material and exposing it, we are making what is known as a photogram. This is the same method Anna Atkins used to make some of the first cyanotype images. For this composition, I took my glass out of the frame and placed it on top of my easel to hold the foliage in place. I have found that flatter objects work best for this method, but don't be afraid to experiment. Objects like coins, stones, paper cutouts, string, jewelry, etc. can make for some interesting images. I exposed this photogram for 20 minutes, moving it several times to follow the sunlight. After your images are exposed, we're going to rinse them off in plain water. Start by placing your print into the first water bath and gently agitate to rinse off the emulsion. This will stop the image from developing any further. Next. Add some hydrogen peroxide to the second water bath. The hydrogen peroxide is going to brighten the whites and deepen the blue tones. This effect will be more or less dramatic based on a number of factors, including how even your coat was, the kind of paper you used, how long you let your paper dry for, and also how long you exposed your image. There is no set measurement for how much hydrogen peroxide to use, and I wouldn't worry about adding too much. In my experience, more isn't really going to affect the outcome. Once you're satisfied that your print is done deepening, place your print back into the first water bath to rinse out the hydrogen peroxide. Continue on like this until you've rinsed out all your prints. Once your water gets tinted green, it's time to replace it with fresh water. The water and cyanotype mixture is safe to go down the drain in small quantities, but we will talk more about the proper disposal of chemicals later on. Once you're done developing your prints, you're going to want to hang them to dry. These are all the prints I've done so far for this project, and you can see how different they all turned out. You can really change a lot just by changing the exposure time or the editing in Photoshop. So I encourage you to experiment until you're happy with the results. Before I let you go, I want to let you know about a great resource Recology has to offer. While cyanotype chemicals are not as harsh as other photochemicals, and they are safe to go down the drain in small quantities, we generally discourage pouring any chemicals down the drain or leaving them in your curbside bins. To be safe, it is recommended that you take any household or photochemical to the San Francisco Household Hazardous Waste Collection Center at the Recology Transfer Station. It is free for SF residents to drop off any household hazardous waste and Recology also offers a pickup program if you are unable to drop off. To learn more about this service and see other videos like this, please refer to the Recology website. Once again, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed this process.